Um, thanks for being here, and uh, it's an awesome, awesome session tonight. Very excited about it. This one is about classroom management, and we have the 2010 Kentucky Teacher of the Year, Butch Ham, who is here, and he'll be talking to us about different strategies that you can use to help you in the class. So I will hand this over to him, and uh, we'll get started. Is it working? It'll, it's going to be back. Oh, yeah. oh. Hey, let me take your phone, too. <laughs> Well, good evening, folks. Thank you for letting me come and visit with you again this year. I did it last year as well and really enjoyed it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about myself as soon as I get situated here. But more importantly, I really want to know something about you while I'm working things together. There's a table tent. Uh, if you would fold it over and then write your name in marker so that it's big enough that I can read it, just your first name. And then I really would like to know your school as well, so that I know whether you're at an elementary, middle school, or high school. Uh, and uh, there are markers inside those little baskets sitting around. You're gonna need post-it notes back there, so just move those back there and share them up as you will. So on your table tent on the back side or somewhere inside if you choose, I want you to write down the strangest thing that ever happened in your classroom. Now if you say, I just started Ham, I have no idea what my strangest thing was, I know you've heard stories. Now no holes barred here, anything you want to put down because I've got a few stories myself in my 34 and a half years teaching. So, I, and I will share them along the way, but no holds barred. Put down what happened. I even have a story from my own mother. And on the inside of your table tent, or on the back side. Remember, if you don't have a story, tell the story of someone else. It's that good, huh? Uh, well, I don't even want to share it all out. Oh. I will tell you. Does everyone have a folder? Yeah. Inside the folder, the table tent. and I can't get my book up in my face. I can't see it. So does everybody have a story? You're still struggling with one? You, ha you do have one? It happened yesterday. Oh my gosh. Can we start with you? I'm very grateful to hear from you. Please share with us your strangest story. Um, so yesterday was first period, and I'm out in the hall doing like bathroom and restroom duty. So I come into my class, and not 
two minutes into class, I just hear like a ding, like an oven had been set off, and that's exactly what happened. A young man had brought a toaster oven into the class and cooked about 20 pizza rolls in it before I had even entered the room. Is that right? Wow. That <laughs> Did I just hear a ding? I sent him down to, just to take it to the office and just get it out of there. He had put all the toast, all the pizza rolls into a like, hydro flask type thing and brought them back and was eating them out of the hydro flask. Oh, my gosh. And at that level of commitment, I just let him have his breakfast. First period. Uh, <laughs> another story. I can, you know, th these things are hard to dream up, but they're real. They are very real. Yes, ma'am. Oh no. So my room's falling tapped. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the spam. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is my first year teaching, but I was given the Critter Classroom. So, so far in all of the years this classroom has been in existence, there's bats, mice, and now ants. So, any kind of, there's cats, we've had cats before, but apparently they all roam to my room, and right now I'm combating ants every day. Wow. But we've had a battle on the bookshelf. They canceled the whole staffing. Because of it? Yeah, they, we, we don't like animals. At Cooper, I worked at Cooper uh, as an instructional coach, and we could not keep a vending machine because of the field mice, they're out in the country, and the field mice kept eat, getting into the building and eating all of the candy out of the, out of the machine. So. Cooper does not have any kind of a snack machine at all, and they have to keep the concession stands uh, under lock and key for that very reason and bolted down because of the field mice. Right, let's hear some more. Oh, now I know you have a good story to tell, or you've surely heard of someone else's story. My first year, I'll tell one, and maybe this will get us started. My first year, I was at Ryle High School as a teacher. Uh, <laughs> I'm standing at the door. It's the first day of school, greeting my students. And the lady across the hall, who, was, who taught there as well, was watching my students file in the door. And one goes by, and she goes, oh, my God. And I was like, what? <laughs> What's wrong? You've got her in class. And I'm like, who is, who is she that makes her so special? She calls this teacher to retire. She calls this teacher to retire. And she calls this teacher to retire. And I'm like, I'm not close to retirement yet. This is really going to be a problem for me. Needless to say, I managed to work through her issues and got her on board. But... That was a scary situation knowing that this person had just walked through. We have another story. Anybody else had those warning signs of a student Then you find out differently? I had a kid that actually saw demons before. Oh. And mm -hmm. <laughs> we were warned and warned and warned, and then he would say, like, yeah, there's one standing behind you. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was an interesting year. Oh. He was, I mean, he was a very nice boy. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting year. I had an IEP once. I sat in an IEP meeting and I had a student in my 12th grade English class and it was written in his IEP that I was not allowed, and this was for all of his teachers, none of his teachers were ever allowed to talk to him. He, unless of course he addressed us first. Now can you imagine? What about that? Well, if your students, you had an IEP in the classroom where the student was never, you were never allowed to speak directly to that child unless that child talked to you. But there were other issues as well, including the fact that he locked himself in his bedroom and he never came out. And the, the parents had to put his food outside his door and then he would drag it in and shut the door and lock it. That came out in the meeting as well. Some really serious issues there. But we never, you don't have to know what you're going to encounter. Let me hear somebody else. I don't want to do all of the talking today. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a special ed teacher, and I have a kid that is now in a pull up. He was his first grade, so he's not, he went in full up last year, so we're afraid he's regressing. But he wears the pull up every day, and it was this past week, 
he had peed on himself, and we're like, how did you pee on yourself? And he's, it was a male, and so he just, he said, it just came squirting out. So <laughs> I guess the where he had the pull up, it was uh -huh. not where he needed the, the pull up. up. And he had it pull happened. Up, so. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. I have a story very similar, but much more graphic. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Might as well stick with bodily functions, I guess. Uh, I'm special ed as well, and we had a student who had an accident, and he's in second grade, and we had to give him a change of clothes, and we would allow him into the bathroom to where he had the option of locking himself in, so we like pulled the handle up and not let him lock the door. He proceeds to scream at me and the principal outside the door saying, come in here and smell what I've done in here, like telling us we have to come in and smell what he's done in the bathroom, screaming at us for 10 minutes because we wouldn't let him lock the door, but like it's... Uh -huh. <laughs> How many of you are first year? This is your first teaching experience. Okay, and those of you that are uh, beyond are new to the district, I take it. Is that correct? The couple of you, you're not new to the district. You're just filling in to get some PD today. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's everybody. It's first year unless they their first year was last year and they were doing the MAT. So. Oh, okay. Okay, well good, I, I'm sure you have lots of experiences as well. IEPs are quite interesting. Uh, how many special ed teachers? I, oh, a lot of you, yeah. And trying to set those up with parents that sometimes can be very difficult in ruling on who is, well, whose best interest is at heart. Obviously it's the child. We had a student come in uh, from the middle school who had a very high anxiety and emotional issues and anger issues and the only way to deal with those anger issues was to put him in a sling and let him masturbate. And that released all of the anger. And you go, what? Fortunately, that middle school IEP went away and by the time we got him in the ninth grade. But you go, where do these ideas come from, you know? Was that, did that top yours, Miss Patrick? Kind of. <laughs> you willing to share? Okay, I understand. <laughs> it's all right. Anybody else, one more before we kick on. I had all kinds of crazy experiences because I am a second career teacher. Two years ago, I worked in 30 schools, uh, seven different districts, nine different districts, actually. Um, so I've seen a lot. I can't really grab onto one that sticks out is more bizarre than the next because I've seen a lot. Last year, as you know, I taught um, U.S. History and Psychology at Ryle, and this year I'm a SPED co-teacher at Dixie. If I think back through those varied experiences, and this is not a bad one, but the commons at Ryle is second floor, and I look down. And for some reason, I don't really know, my U.S. history students start calling me Dr. J. I don't have a doctor's degree. I'm pretty sure they don't know who Julius Erving was, basketball player. Uh, but they used to call me Dr. J. So I look down, and here's the cheerleaders, one of my, I called her the chair, chairwoman of the perfectionist club. They're standing in line. I said, well, are you girls going to do anything or what? Are you just going to stand there? And they said, okay, Dr. J, this one's for you. And these like five girls did like four forward flips and stuck it, you know. And it was just so unexpected. You know, I'm walking out of school at like four o'clock and I'm thinking, you know. And so that's not a bad thing, but it was just the strangest thing I've ever seen, yeah. you know, that I can remember. Well, you can appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody in the room has kids that you, they connect to you. And as soon as you do, you make that connection. It's absolutely wonderful the things that they will help you along with. And I will share that out some as we go as well. But I just wanted to give you a little background on me. I, uh, again, my name is Darrell Butch Ham. Uh, I'm 34 years teaching and uh, will be 34 and a half. I'm retiring December 31st. It's hard to believe that it's here. But I am the instructional coach at Ryle High School. I taught at Boone County High School for years before I went to Ryle and taught AP English 3 at Ryle for several years, became the media specialist there, then left Co uh, Ryle to go to Cooper as instructional coach, and now I'm back at Ryle as their instructional coach. 
Uh, my career before that, I spent 10 years in higher education as an assistant professor. So uh, I found that I could make more money working in secondary than I could as a, a, an assistant professor at a university. So this is where the money is, folks. Believe it or not, you might say, well, I don't know. Hey, you work in Kenton County. You make more money than Boone County teachers do. But we're glad to see you're here tonight. Uh, I um, hope that there's something good to take away. I also respect your time. I'm, I'm so thankful there is a clock in the back of the room for a couple of reasons. One, you've worked all day. So have I. And we're all a little tired. But we'll do our very best to push through the material and talk about things. And as we finish up, if we finish just a few minutes early and it works out with Ms. Hendricks that it's okay, then we will wrap things up. But we have uh, a presentation that's been put together by Kentucky Education Association. They designed this and then they trained several people around the state who lived in a various regions to come out and do this classroom management. It's a canned presentation. I want to tell you that up front. However, I'm more than glad to deviate, if we need to, for what's best for you, because that's the important part, is what serves you best. And, it, and along with that, just as an established norm, if you need to get up and go to the restroom, you're free to do so at any time. There is a 10-minute break in there, but when we get to that break uh, in this presentation, if you would like to just push on so that we can put that on, to the end, we will do so. Secondly, at any time, please raise your hand if you have a question, or please just let me be, acknowledge you. If you need something, you wanna ask something, and more importantly, this cannot be a one-man show. I need to hear from you. That was the whole idea with our little icebreaker of you telling me your story and the rest of the group their stories, because as we get into things, you may go, how do I deal with this? I know when I first started teaching back in 1983, I had no idea how to handle discipline. And I was teaching in an inner city school in Georgia in a trailer that had two nasty commodes that were always overflowing and smelling in my classroom. Yeah, there were lots more to it. But then, needless to say, you may have some rough times being in the classroom that houses all of the animals and critters. Or you may simply be in a particular classroom where you don't have the materials necessary. But how do you manage your classroom? That's what's important, is how you get there. So that's what we're going to start with. First is our talk about what does an effective teacher do in the classroom? And then we'll do this by talking about an ineffective teacher, you know, spending all their time dis disciplining. And if you're one of those who are struggling to constantly have to discipline, rather than engage your students or manage them, then there may be something good here that you can benefit from in the process. So just as I said earlier, there are some group norms. Raise your hand when you need to. Step out if you need to go get a drink of water. Use the restroom. But there, if you have anything of any concern, you're more than welcome to pass it on to me. And at the end, I'll give you my email address and I'll be glad to share any of the handouts, any of the materials with you. Uh, I have it all in digital form as well. And boy, is it hot in here, isn't it? Are you all hot? No, I guess it's me in the hot seat. It is, all right. So here's what our objectives and outcomes are, folks. We need to explore the five components. Now, oh, I failed to mention this. I know that Kenton County does not use the Danielson framework, but everyone, and that's what this is built around, but I also know that everyone has to deal with classroom management. And this is this section of the framework that Danielson proposes, Charlotte Danielson, is classroom management material that everyone can benefit from. So we're going to be looking at that. In addition, we're going to discover how your own personal preferences and your own communication <laughs> style impact your students and what do your students do in order to make that communication effective. And to work, we're going to share problems. So I get these up. Oh, I just turned it black. 
but there we go. We're going to share some problems on our posters that we get into and discipline issues that cause concern. There are some wonderful do's and don'ts in these handouts of which you will have available that to take back to the classroom and just familiarize yourself with it and make some suggestions. And if you, somebody poses a problem, and it, last year's group was wonderful. Somebody would raise their hand and say, I have to deal with this. How would you handle it? And I would share my side, but I'm by no far the expert. I've learned right along the same process that you're learning, you know, by experience, that's all. And if I don't know how to handle critters in the classroom, we had a problem with the snake in the um, biology department kept getting loose and they'd always find it in the copier in, at Cooper. It kept trying to get loose and running away. If you're dealing with critters, you know, how do you handle that? That's a management problem as well. And discover the strategies that work to ensure smooth flowing classrooms so that you make those transitions effective and you utilize the time. How many of you would do a lot of testing in your classroom? Whole lot of testing, constant testing. For special ed teachers usually are the ones that are tested out. If you're doing a lot of testing, that creates a big disruption oftentimes. And so you being able to manage the time so that you can get the mileage out of your classroom is very important. And there are many who raise their hands. Fortunately, you don't work in Boone County. But yes, we do a lot of testing. As a matter of fact, I just looked in the spring semester, we have 88 days of school and 42 of those days at Ryle involve some form of testing. 42. That doesn't mean everybody's tested every, you know, the whole school, but think about that. And what kinds of disruptions does that occur, occur in with managing your classroom in order to get instruction out? It's difficult. So we, you know, we have to think about the things that we're focused on in that. So real quickly, tell me, what is classroom management? Can you turn to somebody around you? Most of you are sitting beside someone. And tell, just explain to them. Turn to a partner or shoulder partner and say, this is classroom management. What is it? Am I moving around too much? Am I moving around too much? Okay. <laughs> and you got you have extra folders back there for those people. And I have all of this digitally. I can send it to you if you want as well, including the PowerPoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, if I could bring you back, I have something for you. If you would take out this developing procedures, we will use the back of it later. But I'd like for you to write down for me this. Every time we do a teaching strategy, I want you to record it so that you can take it back to your classroom and maybe utilize it in some way. Now, everybody probably has used talk to a, so, a, a, a shoulder partner. If that's the case, and you want to record the different strategies that I use throughout the evening, just write it down. Talk to a shoulder partner. We will do this throughout. If you choose to record it, fine. And if you don't, it's all right, too. But I want you to pick up on 
the tools that you can use as well as what we'll be discussing. So here's what Ed Glossary says is the definition of classroom management. Do you concur? <coughs> classroom management refers to the wide variety of skills and techniques that teachers use to keep students organized, orderly, focused, attentive on tasks, and academically productive during the class. <coughs> now, let's be honest. That's a mouthful, isn't it? And it's difficult. I got into this profession thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to teach communication skills in my English language arts class. Little did I know not every student likes English language arts. What? They don't like it? So then what happens? We start dealing with classroom discipline issues because I think they should like it and they think not differently, right? And it starts a snowball effect. So I have to find ways to make it work, to make these things work and stay where they need to be. And over the years, the management of that comes. If you feel frustrated with it now, or you're struggling with that process, you'll find a way to cut that path and make it happen. So now, I've got a couple, I've got to get you up. We, get, we can't sit here all night. There in the, um, in the boxes are a bunch of posted notes. What I'd like for you to do is to answer these questions on four different posted notes. What did your best teacher do? How did your best teacher make you feel? What did your worst teacher do? And how did your worst teacher make you feel? These are anonymous. Once you have finished writing out all four, uh, there's the worst feel. Back there is the worst do. Best feel and best do. Please post your four up on the wall, and then we're going to divide up. You may have noticed there was a little dot on the back of your sheet. Okay. There's red, yellow, green, and blue. I'm going to assign you a poster here in just a second, depending on your dot. where everybody's from. Do you? Oh, I love it out there. So nice. I observed a teacher out there for the Teacher of the Year program. She was really good. I can't remember. She was a math teacher, eighth grade. No, no, no. Uh, uh, no, it was fifth grade. I'm fifth grade math, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Oh, really? She was an older lady. But boy, she was good. Yeah. yeah, have you? How nice to be out there, though. I can't even work. Yes, please. Just stick them on the poster. We'll organize here in a short. Worst feel, worst do, best do, and best feel. So I'll just make up here. Lots of elementary. Do you, are you resource or are you uh, collaborative? I do both. Do so you? I do. So I have study skills and collaborative classes. Oh, what do you collaborate with? What do uh, you English, area? Junior English. Oh, yeah. okay.
Has everyone posted? Okay. Okay, folks, if you would look and see what color dot you have, and I'm going to assign you to a poster. If you're colorblind, I'll be glad to interpret for you. All right, if I could please have the greens come to worst field, but wait till I get them all called out. The blues, we're going to go back to the worst do. The red to the best feel and the yellows to the best do. Everybody got it? Yellow, red, blue, green. Now, when you get there, I want you to read over them first and then begin to order them in some assemblies. It doesn't matter what you, or how you order them, but come up with a way to organize them. Oh, I'm sorry. There is no right or wrong way. Yes, right there. We've got a lot of red. Does, hey, uh, you want to come up, come up here and join this group because they're short. If you don't mind, I appreciate it, Scott. What color is this group? This one is uh, I forgot already. Blue, green. I'll do green. Okay, thank you. Just kind of distribute some of the. Thank you. We're going to see them all in a minute. Sometimes. 
All right. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> You've got yours together? Good. Um, you want to take a pen here and are you going to have a pen? Just label what you, how you categorize them. Does somebody want to just jot down how you categorize them? Just work with the pen as it is. I want to kind of jot down. See if my pen will write and just jot down how you categorize them at the top. Or oh, we did it by color. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I like it. Okay. Okay, guys, if I could draw your attention back this way, stay where you are. But uh, if uh, we can have a spokesperson from each group, just share out what you have up there. How did you categorize them? By the way, you can use this tool, and we'll write it down on our list here in a minute. This is a great activity. Notice what you had to do. You had to think, okay, it's a strategy for getting kids to think about how they can put things into categories or to be able to manipulate things into a way of understanding. So, or to even have them to be able to express their opinions. So, and you could use any of the four categories. So we'll record that here in a minute if you're interested. But let's we'll start with worst feel. Were there anything that just shocked you? And then tell us what you did to categorize them. Um, well, we categorized them by academic okay. performance, the way they felt in academic performance up here, and then down here with emotional. Okay. Um, I thought the one that stood out to me was like a number. I thought that was creative. Uh, so it just felt like a number, like just another number in the class versus like... That's so unfortunate, isn't it? Because yeah. there is no connection that's happening there with kids. And we all know that connecting to kids, they have to feel like they are more than just a number. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about back in the best, uh, the worst do? Um, we categorized it in four different. We have relationships, um, your assignments, so how you taught... Um, you're having a negative ad or your attitude and then um, the engagement. Okay. Was there any one or two that just stood out to you all? Um, I think it was kind of surprising that there were so many in all four of those categories that we kind of, like, we didn't have it was all of them. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. It, and to think four. that this is what people walk away feeling from particular teachers in their, in their own educational processes. Best feel? Mm -hmm. Your little outliers. Yes. Okay, very good. And what about best do? Uh, okay, we, do, we did it by color first. So we split them by color. And then this is our artistic top, group. Um, where it's more like um, the content or academic base or how you felt like you connected with their teaching style more. Um, for example, one was like the science experiment, so that's how the teacher chose to portray the content. And then we worked our way down um, towards like feelings and the emotional connection that you felt with the teacher and how that impacted you in the best way. 
Okay, so notice how different people categorize things differently based on strategy. Think about this as you utilize a, this kind of a tool in your own classroom. When you put up a poster and then you have kids go to uh, for four different strategies or even six if you added to it and they take posted notes and, and plot out things and then take go to it and organize it in some way. It's a great way to get kids up and get them moving. And if you want to record that, this particular tool, after you get back to your seat, you can. But at this point, I'd like for you just to take a gallery walk, read some of the things that are put up. You'll be quite surprised at the things that people say. So if you already know what best do is, make sure you found yourself around to the other three to read them. Some of these are tragic. And you go, oh my gosh. Law, bored, little no good enough, smart. Do you have a teacher to tell you you're not good enough, you're not smart? I've seen teachers do that, embarrass kids in front of all of their peers. It's so hard on them. So if I can bring you back, I think everybody's made it around. Could anybody utilize this same strategy in the classroom? Or have you? Have you used post-it notes and signals to categorize information or to get kids to think about information, first scattering it out and then going back and reorganizing it as groups? It's a great tool to help to teach kids how to do things like categorizing, thinking about things, offering up their opinion. So it's a, it is a strategy. I throw that out if you want to record it on your sheet. Um, I, we often label it as the brainstorm carousel because you're, you're actually going around and you're looking at it. Brainstorm carousel. Okay, so we wrap this section up simply by saying you're always responsible for how you act no matter how you feel. Is that not true? You know what? I'm going to say this. Uh, I'm a severe diabetic. I take insulin, four shots of insulin a day. And I struggle with sometimes feeling bad. But when I was in the classroom teaching, I, it wasn't every day, but there would be on a rare occasion that I was just absolutely sick. But I was there, and I always told my kids I didn't feel well. And you know what? They honored it. They owned up to it. Why? Because kids appreciate the fact that you're being honest with them. 
you know, and they would walk out of the room and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Ham. I'm really sorry you don't feel good. I hope you feel better tomorrow, Mr. Ham, you know. But it's not that I wanted pity for him, but it's owning and building relationship and communicating because you know what it did? It allowed me to let the kids see me as a human and not as some super individual outside of school. You know, have you ever gone to the supermarket and seen kids and they want to acknowledge, but they pretend like they don't see you or don't acknowledge you because they feel like, oh, I can't see a teacher outside of school and recognize. You know, elementary kids I know are different, but high school and middle school kids, they often will, will kind of nod like, mom, look, there's, there's so-and-so, but they won't even speak to you sometimes. I think that's odd, but it's just it's a human quality, I think, that they think that teachers are superhuman, but we're not. We're just like they are, and building that interpersonal. So this next section talks about knowing thyself. Who are you? And knowing who you are and your style of communicating will help you to become better at teaching. So we're going to do a, a communication uh, in, uh, styles inventory, which you may have done before, but I'd like for you to really think about it again. And it's in your packet here. We'll work our way to it. What's your style? So what you're looking at is, so you're going to find the handout that says classroom management personal inventory. Now, complete this inventory and just discover your style if you didn't already. There's two parts there to it. You actually answer the questions and then record the answers on the back sheet. Was it not in order? It should, it's a stapled copy. Did you find it? Yes, that's it. Oh, mm it is -hmm. No, it, it's the uh, commu the classroom styles inventory, in the communication styles inventory. Does anybody need it? Because I had students stuff these packets today. There may not be a guarantee that everything is there. <coughs> communication styles inventory looks like this. Did you find it? Not in order. It should have been close. I asked them to put them in order. But here, just take this one. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you communicate? Do your kids know? I see where the confusion was. There's a slide missing. I apologize. Do the communication first, and then we're going to move to the classroom style.
Show a little interest and thoughts and ideas of show a little bit of originality. attention to detail, but um, indecisive. <laughs> <laughs> you can be some of both characteristics. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if any of you should ever want to do this inventory with your students, I have it. Uh, in digital form, I can send it to you. And before we leave tonight, you'll have my email. So, because it will let you know how do your kids, and when you go to do groupings of kids, this will help you to understand that, oh, this child is more of a sensor. So uh, I'm, you may choose to put he, he or she in that group that, of sensors. Or you may want a different person with each one of the communication styles. Because oftentimes one style lends itself to be the reporter, the other one the taskmaster, master, you know. Then you can manage your groupings that way as well. Does anybody use Kagan strategies? I don't mean to interrupt. Do you love Craig Kagan? No, yes. I do. I enjoy using Kagan, even at the high school level. And I teach two classes for NKU. Uh, um, and I do Kagan in my college classes as well. I think it can be done. A bit of high school teachers go, uh, no, that's too elementary. Believe it or not, there's some of those strategies that work very well in the classroom for high school. You have to do it like four is the most likely to you, and then three is kind of like you, two is somewhat, and then one's not at all. And I feel like I was confused. We did it right. I still think I'm right. <laughs> it still, it still defines who you are, right? It does. My exact answer. Yeah, nice You're a feeler. I just picked all the ones that I had fours in my school. The ones I chose. That's why. I did it. 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 Okay. Social studies? That's like the bottom. But you're kind of even on these three. So after you've finished, then you're going to go back for number one? Yes. And A. Whatever you recorded for A, you're going to write that number in, like all the way across. 
And whatever you covered, you covered for B, you would write that number in. And C and then D. You're writing the number across, all right? Then after you filled in all of the answers, you go down, Scott, and add them all up, and it'll give you the sense of where you are. I I know we have people finishing up, and that's great, but for the sake of time, because we've already been here an hour, let's move on, and uh, let me just get a brief discussion. Was it true for you, or not so true? Now, there are people that will argue, well, I, I, uh, I looked at a couple up here, and they had three that were almost the same, that they're across the board, all of these, but one category that isn't. And it may or may not be true for you. It just depends on how you answered the process uh, and were you able to say, well, right in the moment, this is how I feel. But tomorrow, when I have to go back in the classroom after being in a meeting all night, I might not feel the same. So, you know, it's all about that. Thinking about what you, in overall and in general, how do you... Now, if you know what your students are like, this helps you to be able to, be, to understand them more. Now, how many of you spend the first two weeks of school just teaching procedure? Ah, and are you all elementary, aren't you? Uh-huh, I thought. But we as high school and middle school teachers need to do the same thing. You get them into a routine of what you, your expectations are and how you're going to man, run your classroom. And it is worth every minute of the time you give up to spend that time just teaching procedure. And this is an opportunity, and I have this in digital form, for you to find out about your kids as well, for you to give them this inventory, find out what they're like. When you go to build your Kagan groups, for those of you that said you use Kagan strategies, you may choose to put one of these, each individual students at, their t at the table as opposed to organizing it by, you know, uh, devel uh, developmental learning versus those individuals who are high interest learning. I know that goes against what Kagan says, but it is. Uh-oh, what do we got here? Oh, no. In one minute. We don't need this, do we? Did we save it? Okay. Now take out the classroom management style inventory. And let's work through that. Oh, it's shutting down anyway. Needs a password. Yes. Huh? Huh? <laughs> it's starting Windows. Yeah, I guess it's starting back up again. And he saved it to the desktop, so the PowerPoint's on the desktop. Yes, um, this is your own classroom management style. This is how you manage your classroom.
program. But these are okay. Are they so they new to the district, or they? Uh, yeah. So this would be a Q-tip group. If you have to. Okay. So this is would be a Q-tip group. If you had to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that. I mean, that's awesome. But this gives me things to reflect on. That they can bring back and put in there. Like I'm going to bring that up. I just see that. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's your job a lot easier. What part are you going to do? I don't like that. That's my worst. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes it's hard when a kid says something yeah. to another kid, and you know it's the honest truth, yeah. but yeah. you know it's also wrong. It is so hard to go bite your tongue and not say anything. I had a kid that has had he had from here all through the main call the kid that was born in the dick. I was like, yeah, because he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't you can't say that if you're like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, number 11 and 12. I think we're right there. Yeah. Okay. F5, and then, or no, that won't take you to this. It takes you to the beginning. Go to slideshow up at the top. And then from, where does it say? From current slide, the second one. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's talk. I want to know what came out of this sheet for you. Does it reveal anything about the way you run your classroom? Does it? You, I'm hopefully you were truthful with yourself. What would you like to change, if anything? Okay, how many of you are authoritarian? Hands up high. I want to see it. Don't be shy about it. Okay, got one. How many of you are permissive? Okay. Tentative? Any tentative? Okay. Uh, collaborative? Okay. In your communication with them, your characterizes your management style. A spontaneous. <laughs> okay, eclectic. Oh, we got a lot in here that are eclectic uh, and dependent. Okay, all right. Then uh, your temperament. Easygoing. Oh, good. You know, I found a long time ago, and I just throw this out even for myself. A strategy was never to let anything get to me. 
Now, happy pills do a nice job with that too. <laughs> but I want to tell you, just not letting things get to you really helps to manage some of the behaviors. You know, a, a, a friend of mine said, I don't even know how you can teach uh, uh, kids in school. And, uh, you know, because of the, there, there are so many different behaviors and, and, and such. And I'm like, you know, if you treat them like a human being, even your worst kid, you can win them <laughs> over in some way. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I hope this doesn't offend, but this is a really interesting story. I had this girl, the same girl, oh, I already told you, the same girl who walked into my room the first day a year I was at Ryle, and uh, they said she had caused three teachers to retire throughout her year. She was a, a senior at Ryle, and through the year, they all quit because of this girl, Brittany. So Brittany's in my class, and she's unruly, out of control, obnoxious, but it's a collaborative class. Brittany was also pretty smart. I, I discovered from writing she could write well. And I'm in a collaborative setting. So within a few months, I'm, think, I'm trying everything from you know, trying to bring her on board and get her to clean, get her mouth shut. I got to piss, she would say. You know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'm just not a used to, or no one's accustomed to that kind of uh, communication. She won't tell everybody. So the uh, story goes like this, though. Uh, I, I managed to get her on board. And the way I got her on board was to ask her to help me in a collaborative setting. She was bright. She was a good writer. She could do things. And in this classroom where they needed help, it was a vocational classroom for the most part. And the, these guys, and it was full of guys, and they all needed help with their senior research paper. And she could do it. She had already proved that. So immediately, I, I started asking her for things. Would you please help this group of guys? I, you know, I don't want to sit with them. And I'd say, Brittany, if you could help them, you could help me in that process. And I really need the help. I reached out to her in that way, and it didn't take long before eventually she's going, would you guys shut up? He's trying to talk. I'm like, well, I appreciate it, Brittany, but let, you know, let me try to calm down in the sense. But I won her over in that manner by finding out that this girl was good at writing. Oh, I entered her in the scholastic writing contest. I encouraged her to write, and she won, and you'd think that she, you know, she'd won a ribbon, and she thought she'd you know, had won a grand prize from, you know, a world competition. But it was that kind of connections that we have to make in order to bring some kids on board. And it's hard when you've got that squirrely one that just won't sit still or won't work. And I only use that as one, I've had many failures as a teacher, numerous failures, but that was one success that I was able to manage to get through. I'm easy going too. I learned a long time ago not to be confrontational because all it does is escalate. And those kids who are confrontational are used to that at home. They're used to someone yelling at them. So that's their style of communication, isn't it? With them yelling out at you because that's how they communicate at home. I just always kept my voice tame. Like I said, Happy Pills did a nice job of that. But not letting it to escalate. And I would say, we'll talk about this after class. And after class, I held them back and we had a conversation. And you know what I would do? I don't know what you do, but I think this is a great tool, is to say, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Rather than, why were you yelling in class? Or why were you being so unruly? I put it back in their court, asking them to communicate why they feel the way they feel. I was in a classroom at Ryle the other day, a biology classroom where it's been, there's been some problems with the discipline. And this one boy was watching a video on his phone while the teacher's teaching in the back of the room. And I called him out on it and he got loud with me. And I said, come on, let's go out in the hallway and talk. I'm not going with you. I said, come on, let's talk. I'm just going to Mr. Schaefer's office. I said, okay, come on. I got it out in the hallway. I knew he didn't want to go to Mr. Schaefer's office, and we talked. I said, come on, let's walk down the hall. 
where's your locker? Because he was missing. He didn't have his work, and he was watching a, a, some kind of a movie on his phone. And I said, what's going on? Uh, I've had a really rough day. Well, what happened? So, and it was six period two, by the way. So, you know, it was all that had transpired throughout the day that had built up to this breakdown at the end of the day. Sometimes it's understanding where they are coming from versus actually pinpointing and blaming for the behavior. That's the hard part, is being able to manage that, to manage it. What about your style of communication? <coughs> Are you pretty open? Are you going to tell them what you did on the weekend? An edited version. An edited version? <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Lori. Uh, yeah, I, I had to have a conversation with a new teacher in our building for that very reason. You know, but, and she's teaching seniors, and she's a brand new teacher fresh out of college, which was probably a mistake on the admin's part to put a 23-year-old in a room with 17 and 18-year-olds. But that happened. Huh? I said I'm, I'm 23 and I work with 16 and 17-year-olds. Yeah, but you, there, you have to know where that line is, and right. she hadn't defined that. So we had to have a conversation about how do you define that because she was starting to have discipline problems. She didn't even know why she was having them. Well. When you tell them what all you've done on the weekend and then ask them, don't you want to know what I did this weekend? I heard her say that to her students. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's that knowing, being open-ended with your communication, but also recognizing where do you draw the line in professionalism, right? Knowing what you can talk about and what you can't talk about. What's your style of record keeping? And does that differ in, different from what your kid's style of keeping things together? And how do you handle that? Scott? One reason I segued into SPED, collaborative teaching, is I like the idea of coming from social emotional learning and teaching psychology of helping kids. Mm -hmm. I had no earthly idea that I would need to be a SPED paralegal. <laughs> so I'm all about Excel spreadsheets mm -hmm. and things like that. There's so many different portals that I, so many um, gods that I have to bow down to right. that it's really daunting, mm -hmm. frankly. I understand. And I, I, believe me, I fully understand. But with kids, what about them, the ones that come to your room that has the binder, the stuff sticking out everywhere? You know? And yet you have the most meticulous desk. That stapler goes right here and nowhere else. Are you that kind of a person? You know? You know, I've even seen teachers have outlines of things. You didn't put it back where it belongs. You know? Now, what, when we have that kind of a difference, how does that affect how we manage the classroom? My point is this. And through all of this, and we won't continue working through all of the sheet, but I wanted you to understand where you're coming from, both as a communicator and as you manage your classroom. And how does that match up to kids and their differences? You know, we, um, we, we, I have worked with a teacher who the kids call her the judge because she's the judge and the jury. She passes judgment <laughs> on everyone because they have to do everything the way she expects it to be done. Or they lose points. Or they lose out on, if they didn't make it up in the time they were given, it doesn't matter what the excuse is, sorry, you get a big old zero. That kind of management doesn't work for everyone, does it? I know as your special ed teachers, you know how you have to be able to work and be flexible. I think if I had anything else that I would preach to you, it is flexibility. The, you'll gain so much more respect from kids. And I'm not talking about the kid who's, who does this you know, habitually. You're going to have to deal with that. But having some flexibility is very important. Uh-oh, what? Oh, okay, good. I was like, please, no, not another download. 
Okay, let's see. I got to fix that in order to move forward. I don't think we can just hit the space bar. Oh, no. Update is already installed. There we go. So I'm going to skip over this so that we have time to finish up here. I promised you I didn't give you a break, but that we would move through the break time so we get out just a few minutes early. So I'm going to move on. But Charlotte Danielson, and you have her framework, a copy of her classroom management framework. It's domain two. Now, of which she talks about. I know that's different than the way that you measure classroom management, but she has some great information and in how she breaks it down. I think it's good for you to look at. Just to take a look at her domains of which she offers in uh, classroom. All right. So, as I said, I'm going to skip through because I want to get to something else. This is my, one of my favorite quotes. It says, show respect even to people you don't, who don't deserve it. Not as a reflection of their character, but as a reflection of yours. I, you know, the judge and jury teacher that I was referring to passes judgment on kids and they're labeled the first day they're in her classroom and they stay that label the entire year. And it's... It's really hard when you, know, you walk into a classroom and all of a sudden you become that label. You know, it is so important that we have forgiving hearts and that we're open. Yes, kids say things that they don't mean. But being able to forget about it and start the new day over the next day is so important to being an effective manager in the classroom. All right, we're going to do something. I want you to take another post-it note. And I want you to write down what you think respect is. And just write respect and then what you think it is. Flip it over. Write rapport and what you think rapport is. We're getting ready to do a Kagan strategy with it. Don't put your name on it. Just respect. Define it. Rapport. Define it. Respect and what you think the definition of it is and rapport and what you think the definition is on the other side. Just one post-it note because we're going to trade them out here shortly. Respect on what you think it is. I mean, I've got to feel a definition up there, but you think about your own. What it is, or operationalize it. You ever heard that term? It's no such word, by the way, but I always use it. To operationalize means to put it in your own words made up, but how many of you use Kagan strategy quiz quiz trade? I love this one because you don't even have to quiz. All you have to do is share. And it's a great strategy. I use it in my PDs at Ryle all the time. And then teachers have branched out and used it extensively as well. With Quiz Quiz Trade, for those of you that are not familiar with it, this is what happens. You're going to stand up and you're going to pair up with someone. And you're going to introduce yourself if you haven't introduced yourself or know each other. And you're going to say, my definition of rapport is... And then flip it over and say, my definition of respect is. The other person's going to do the same. You can have a conversation if you'd like. But then, after you have done it, you're going to trade it off. And you're now assuming the definition of someone else. 
and you're going to find another partner. You raise your hand and you find a partner. You hook up. That's right. You hook up and then you say, hi, I'm Butch Ham. And, and Kennedy says, hi, I'm Kennedy. We trade off. Did I get it right? Yes. Uh, we trade off. We start with our definition that we have. For, this person's definition of is, and then this person's definition of this is, she shares the same. We have a conversation about it. We trade, and then we raise our hands and move on to another person. It's called quiz, quiz, trade. It's often used when you're trying to quiz students over vocabulary. It's a great tool if you're teaching vocabulary to do so. It'll get you up out of your seat. We'll spend about five minutes on it. So if everybody would stand up. Oh, oh, oh we got writers still. How many? Uh, close. When you're done, stand up. You're going to raise your hand, pair up with somebody, <laughs> trade your definition out, or, or communicate your definition, then trade out and find another partner. 